So yes, Jesus gives his disciples an F minus, but he continues to prepare them. Does he not? He tells them, all of you will be offended by my behavior this evening and will abandon me. And of course, who is the first one to speak? The author of our lessons for this second quarter. Was he sincere? Oh, yeah. yes. Absolutely. Were the other 11 disciples sincere? Yes. Absolutely. Let me warn you about something. Sincerity is meaningless. Okay? Because our sincerity comes from our sinful heart. And it doesn't matter how well meaning we are, how many tears we shed, until you understand that you have a terminal disease in your symbolic heart. It's called our sinful nature. Is that why it starts with S-I, sincerely starts with S-I-U? thought about that. Until you and I recognize that, we're going to be 100% vulnerable to deception as the 12 disciples were, even though they saw and heard everything that we've read so far. I share that with you, not in a judgmental way, but from an experiential standpoint. I have said in my past, oh, how could these people not get it? How can these people do this? How could these people say this after being what? Eyewitnesses. Is it possible that we are not getting it? Is that a possibility? Okay. What happens after that? Who would like to read Matthew 26, 52 through 56? Matthew 26, 52 to 56. Peter, when Jesus is arrested, does something very, very, very impressive to prove his point to Jesus, that he's ready to die with Jesus. So he takes out his sword and whacks off the ear of the high priest's servant. Now, who would like to read verses 52 through 56? Anyone? Okay. Who? Okay. Patty? Jesus said to him, Bring your sword into its place, for all who should take the sword will perish by the sword. For do you think that I cannot now pray to my Father, who will find me more than you are each of the angels? How then can the scriptures be fulfilled that it must happen thus? In that hour, Jesus. I sat daily with you teaching in the temple, and you did not cease me. But all this was done that the scriptures of the prophets must be fulfilled. And all the, the disciples were serving in the temple. How can that happen? How can that happen? After all of the visual and audible demonstrations of the Godhead's power to prove what Jesus' mission was, not to establish an earthly kingdom, but to redeem the human race. How in the world can that happen? There's two influences that cause this situation. Understanding and appreciating Jesus' mission before the cross. Before the cross. Let's go back to 2 Peter chapter 1 and find out what is the first influence that prevented the disciples from appreciating his mission, understanding it, and being supportive of him as he concluded his mission of redeeming the human race. There's two striking <coughs> underlying influences that cause this situation to happen. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 19. Who would like to read that for us? Second Peter chapter 1, verse 19. Sue Ella. And so we have the prophetic... Oh. 
I'll come back to you for another. <laughs> we have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereupon ye do well that ye take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your heart. Oh. Now we got a little true here. And we need to follow this true. Who would like to turn, and if you want to, all of you, and read what is the definition of what well, we just got to reading? Luke chapter 1, verse 78. Luke chapter 1, verse 78. Luke chapter 1, verse 78. Keep your finger on 2 Peter 1 because we're coming back there. Luke chapter 1, 78. Who would like to read that for us? Okay, back on. For the tender mercy of our God, with which the day spring from on high has visited us. Thank you. What does the word dawn mean? The sun is coming up. Right? And the dawn has visited us from where? From on high. That's what Peter is talking about here. A converted Peter. A converted Peter. The day dawns. Alright? What does the term, the morning star arises in your hearts? Let's turn to Revelation 22, 16. Tom, would you like to read that for us? Revelation 22, verse 16. The morning star rises in your hearts. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things for the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright morning star. So it's very clear that what we're talking about here is not just being an eyewitness to something or hearing it. But something must take place internally for me to understand, number one, and appreciate what we're studying here. Do you agree? Yes. Our lesson gives the answer as to how this can happen. I'm going to read it to you word for word. It's on page 83, Tuesday's lesson, a quotation from this lady that we talked about earlier that saw the Salamanca vision. Okay, here we go. Quote, the whole earth is to be illuminated with the glory of God's truth. Does that remind you of anything? Who would like to read 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18? 2 Corinthians, Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. Christian world today. You know why? 
Because people that focus on Jesus as dying on the cross, including the movie, are focused on the physical aspect of it. The bleeding. And the body that, you know, emotions in the movie. I didn't see the movie, but I was told about it. And I said, how can I go and see a movie? And I saw the little, you know, little excerpts of it you know, on TV advertising the movie. I said, how can I possibly go see a movie like that when they've missed the point of the movie? They've missed the point of the cross. The purpose of the cross is to humiliate a human being and make him suffer for the longest period of time before they die. But Jesus died in what period of time? From the time that he was hung up? About six hours maximum. So, crucifying Jesus from a physical standpoint was a 100% failure. The person that God gave the Salamanca vision to says that Jesus died of a broken heart. And that's what we're talking about here. Why? Well, we learn that in chapter 11 of John, that when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, what immediately began to take place among the religious leaders? They began to plot his death. So folks, it's really irrelevant what we see or what we hear. If it doesn't move from here to here, you can see someone die. And it doesn't have an effect. You can see someone that's died be resurrected. In Luke 16, Jesus uses a parable. He says, look, if they don't believe the Old Testament prophets that I sent to them, even if I raise someone from there that, you're, that they're familiar with, maybe one of their relatives, they still won't believe. Yes. On Friday, in the uh, further thought, we have the solution to the issue of being deceived. I'm going to read the first paragraph to you. That's page 86. It's a quotation from Ellen White. It is the first and highest duty of every rational being to learn from the scripture what is truth and then to walk in the light and encourage others to follow your example. We should day by day study the Bible diligently, weighing every thought and comparing every scripture with scripture. With divine help, we are to form our opinions for ourselves. In other words, arrive at a determination or a conclusion based on what you have read and the promise of the Holy Spirit to open your mind and your heart. With divine help, we are to form our opinions for ourselves as we are to answer for ourselves before God. So what instruction have we been given on how to study the Bible? Regardless of what education you have. Regardless of your background as a Christian. People say, oh, Chuck, you were blessed to be raised as Seventh-day Adventist. No, that's not correct. I was raised a little heathen. <laughs> and in my last quarter of high school, I was exposed to Seventh-day Adventists. Let's turn to John 14, 26. John 14, 26. John chapter 14, 26. Here's the first step in how to understand and appreciate from the heart what God has seen fit to inspire to be recorded for who? Us upon whom the ends of the world have come. 1 Corinthians 10, 11. John 14, 26. Are you there? Yes. Here we go. But the parakletos, that's the Greek word for helper or the Holy Spirit, and it, Jesus says it again. But the helper, comma, so there's no confusion. The Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, He will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance 
all that I said to you. Do you like that? Yes. question is, do you believe it? Okay. Now, flip over to the right. John 16, 13. This one gets a little bit more detail. John 16, 13. But when He, the Spirit of truth, comes, He will guide you into how much truth? Oh. For He will not speak of His own initiative, but whatever He hears, He will speak and He will disclose to you what is to come. No surprises with God, ever. God never allows you to be surprised, ever. Ever. So you don't have to wake up any morning and say, oh, what kind of a day is this going to be? No, you don't have to wonder that. It's going to be the most intimate day relationship with Christ that you allow it to be. The word parakletos, P-A-R-A, -A, means parallel to us. It's right here. Why is it no longer in here? Because we kicked it out in the Garden of Eden. But Ephesians 1, first four verses, makes it very clear that even though we're in dealt with the spirit of disobedience, the who? The paracletus is right here. And all we have to do is what? Bump it and say, take over. Is that scriptural? Romans 8, 9 and 10. But you are no longer under the influence of the flesh, but of the spirit, if so be it that the spirit of Christ dwells in you. Because if the Spirit of Christ does not dwell in you, you don't belong to Christ. I don't care what day you go to work, church, what day, how you eat, how you dress, you do not belong to Christ. But if the Holy Spirit is in you, then the body becomes dead as to the sin problem. Because the life and righteousness of Christ has come in to take over your life by your permission. That's what said, I mean, Romans. Uh, 8, 9, 10, it says. The question is, what am I going to do with it? Am I going to push the button that says enter? Or am I going to say, not ready yet? Or delete? That's my choice. But that's the issue. God says, I need to cleanse the people. When Paul speaks of cleansing the heavenly sanctuary, people think, oh, that's talking about sinning, the verb. No. It's talking about you letting the intercessor, Jesus, who is appealing to you, saying, Chuck, you're waking up. I have an invitation for you, a personal invitation. Would you like to spend the waking hours of this day in my private office with me? Would you like to do that, Chuck? That's what it means to put away sin. Let Jesus cleanse what? Your heart. That's the issue. When God has a generation of people that are focused on that, which is what all heaven is focused on, then there will be a generation of people where that will experience what we're studying here. The what? The bright and morning star has arisen for you. In our hearts. Do you like that? It's biblical. Okay. Jesus, through the prophets, and he personally, has always warned us of what is coming. Never any surprises. Remember Matthew 24, 24? Who would like to read Matthew 24, 24? Matthew 24, verse 24.
what you have to answer to yourself is, how am I going to deal with it? Am I going to deal with it on my own? Or am I going to turn it over to Jesus as He turned what? Every decision, experience, and temptation over to whom? His Father. And constantly allowed Himself to be led by whom? For 33 and a half years. By the Holy Spirit. And then we will experience the same results in our lives as He did. Which He not only promises, but guarantees. Now, let's take a look at the second paragraph in Friday's section, Further Thought. Quote, beginning the second paragraph. The truths most plainly revealed in the Bible have been involved in doubt, darkness, by who? Learned men, who with a pretense of great wisdom teach that the scriptures have a mystical, a secret, spiritual meaning, not apparent in the language employed. What did Jesus just say in Matthew 24, 24? Atheists are coming to deceive you? No. He said, false prophets. Oh, how do false prophets come? They look very well. Dignified. When I give a Bible study with people, the first thing I say is, I'm glad to study with you as long as you understand that it's the Holy Spirit that's going to teach us. Don't you dare accept anything I say or any other member of the human race, what they write or say, I don't care how many titles or how many degrees or what they say or write. That's not an original thought with me. That's an original thought with the Apostle Paul in Acts 17, 11, when he said to the Bereans, you are the most noble of all the Christians that I come across. Because you respectfully listen to what is presented from the synagogue, and then you go home and you scrutinize it, check it out to see if it's what? Consistent with Scripture. Next sentence. These men and women are false teachers. It was to such a class that Jesus declared, quote, Ye know not the Scriptures, neither the power of God. Mark 12, 24. The language of the Bible should be explained according to its obvious meaning, unless a symbol or a figure is employed. Christ has given the promise, quote, If any man will do God's will, he shall know the doctrine. John 7, 17. If men would but take the Bible as it reads, if there were no false teachers to mislead and confuse, but there are, their minds, a work would be accomplished that would make angels glad and that would bring into the fold of Christ thousands upon thousands who are now wandering in error. Oh. What does that mean, wandering in error? Are you familiar with Revelation 18, 1 through 4? We know about the three angels' messages, but do you know that there's a fourth angel? Yeah. He shows up in Revelation 18. And what does verse 1 of Revelation 18 say? After Someone like these, to read that? After these things I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was illuminated with his glory. Thank you. Coming down from heaven. What is that? A physical angel or is that a message? Message. That's a message. From where? From heaven. To illumine what? The earth with what? Glory. That is the first step. Matthew 24, 14 cannot be fulfilled. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world as a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. That cannot happen. Revelation uh, 6, 14 through 17, the first half. The second half of the uh, sixth seal cannot happen until what? Verse 3 of Revelation 7 happens. When God has a people that have allowed him to what? Seal them for him. What does the word seal mean? To seal you for security and preservation. Do you like that? Who's doing that?
doing the seating here? Yes. Yes. So please stop talking about Jesus coming back until you are ready to identify with Him. Until you do that, you should be terrified that Jesus would come back because you and I are not ready. Do you want to be ready when Jesus comes? He will get you ready if you give Him permission. That is what Peter is saying here to these people that he's already told them, you are about to be deceived about Jesus' second coming. Do you understand the significance of what we're studying here? I hope so. I hope so. The greatest challenge that we face today, sure, Jesus warned us that Paul's prophets are coming. Yes, we know that. But I think that the greatest challenge that we face today is from sincere, misguided, scholars and teachers that have embraced for the last 450 to 500 years a system of interpreting the Bible called the historical and critical method of interpreting Scripture. Now, what do the verses 20 and 21 of 1 Peter chapter 2 say? 1 Peter chapter 2? 1 Peter chapter 2? I'm going to read it to you. When you get there, say ready. But know this first of all, that no inspired writing is of one's own interpretation or explanation. Continuing the sentence in verse 21. For no inspired writing was ever made by an act of a human being's will. But men and women moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. There's a lot of speculation going on today about the scriptures. What do we need to do for Jesus to come back? In fact, we have been told that what we need to focus on is X number of activities, and then we know that we will be ready to be resurrected when Jesus comes. The reason I'm a Seventh-day Adventist is because I'm convinced that Jesus raised the Seventh-day Adventist church to prepare people to be alive when he comes. And not to be resurrected. Amen. Jesus was preparing people for 2,000 years from the time that he arose till 1844 to prepare people to be resurrected. And that's wonderful. But after 1844, the focus of heaven has been to find a people that will allow the Godhead to prepare them to be resurrected when Jesus comes. To be alive when Jesus comes. And that is what our lesson is all about. If speculation is necessary to add to God's Word, then we're doing what Eve did in the Garden of Eden, Genesis 3, 1 through 5. Where the serpent convinced her that she would not be totally fulfilled as a human being until she knew good and evil. And so she believed him. And in so doing, she was saying, God, you haven't given me enough. I need more. When we begin to add or take away from God's word, we're speculating. Final scripture. Let's go to 1 John chapter 2. 1 John, the next book after... No, the next one is... Uh, 1 John chapter 2, verse 25, 26, and 27. And I'll read it to you because my time is up. I want for you to follow this carefully. <clears throat> Do you have a subheading between verses 24 and 25 of 1 John chapter 2? The promise of eternal life. Promise of eternal life. Do you like that? Who's making the promise here? Jesus. Yeah. Everybody there? Here we go. 1 John 2, beginning with verse 25 to 27. And this is the promise which he himself made to us eternal life. Imagine that. The Savior promising you eternal life. And yet most Christians are concerned about whether they're going to make it to heaven or not. Isn't Jesus good on his promises? Mm, amen. Continuing in verse 26. These things I have written to you concerning those who are trying to what? Deceive you. Why is 
is Peter writing the letter of Second uh, First Peter, uh, Second Peter? Why is he writing? To prepare people not to be what? Deceived. Deceived. Now, look at 27. And as for you, the anointing which you receive from him abides in you. And you have no need for anyone to teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about all things, and is true, and is not a lie, and just 